So welcome everyone to today's Art Talk Live with Tom Friedman. And um, we're so grateful to Tom for preparing this talk today. I haven't heard it yet and I can't wait to hear it. Um, the Southern Faces and Places, Examining Farm Security Administration Photographers of the 1930s. I can't wait to share some of what I learned with touring groups as well through the rest of this show. So we have our Masters of American Photography exhibition organized by the Reading Public Museum on view through June 25th, along with several more great shows. Mary Proctor, I Am Just the Messenger, which is up through December 10th. And the sister show to that, Mary Proctor's Presidents just opened at Tallahassee Museum as well. Uh, we have Terry Corbett, Beyond the Familiar, which is a beautiful exhibition of encaustics. William H. McCowan's Pondering the Panhandle. Of course, William Hugh does incredible watercolor painting from scenes in our area. And our second Gadsden Arts Artist Guild show for this year. I'd like to thank all of the volunteers who have helped put these exhibitions together. We have many, as you can see, um, Gadsden Arts is truly community driven. We have around 88. Uh, volunteers who are active at the museum on a regular basis and we are grateful to all of these people for helping us make these shows a reality. And of course thank you to our sponsors and supporters. Our major exhibitions like Masters of American Photography are made possible by the Impact Fund. So thank you to all of the individuals who have given to the Impact Fund that gives us the resources to schedule major exhibitions years in advance. So Angie and I are now working on major exhibitions for 2025, which is really exciting. And we've got great projects between then and now um, that we're really looking forward to sharing with you. Our title sponsor for Masters of American Photography is Truly. Uh, it is sponsored in memory of Mary Middleton Suber and Rebecca Rutten Shaw. Our exhibitions are sponsored in part by Black Fig, Quincy, uh, the city of Quincy, the Gadsden Tourist Development Council and the Reading Public Museum organize the current show. Also, Mary Proctor, I Am Just the Messenger is supported by grants from the Institute of Museums and Library Services and the National Endowment for the Arts. And we are sponsored in part by the State of Florida Division of Arts and Culture. So now I'd like to welcome Angie Berry, our curator, to introduce Tom. Thank you, Grace. I'm excited to welcome Tom Friedman. He has put together a wonderful show or a wonderful presentation for us today. Tom earned his BA in sociology and his law degree um, and was actually a supervisory special agent for more than 20 years at the FBI headquarters. And but more recently taught as an adjunct professor at Florida State University and at Florida A&M University. Since he formally retired, he has kind of split his efforts between serving his community like the Rotary Club um, <clears throat> and the Citizens Advisory Council for the Senior Center in Tallahassee, as well as his art. He is an artist and is part of our Artist Guild here at the Gadsden Arts Center and Museum. And his art ranges from landscapes to still lifes to modern pieces. And he works in a variety of mediums, charcoal, oil, um, uh, pastels, watercolors. So his work is really great and you can see it on display in our Artist Guild exhibitions. He's worked, his work has been exhibited throughout our region and is in uh, private collections along the East Coast ranging from New York City area down here to Florida. So today Tom is going to give us a bit of an overview of the Farm Security Administration and welcome Tom. I'm going to stop this. And have okay, him and I guess I, I get to share screen now. Okay, this is always a very interesting proposition, and I hope to heck uh, everything works like it's supposed to. All right, can you now see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome to uh, Southern uh, Faces and Places during the Depression. Uh, these are going to be some photographs by Edithia Lang. Walker Evans and Arthur Rothstein, and I think they represent very well uh, the work that was done by the Farm Security Administration. Now, before I actually get into those pictures, let me see, this is supposed to, whoop, there we go. I wanna show you a comparison between the 
types of things that people who draw and paint do and the folks who take photography do because the method of creation of these things is very, very different. Painters reconstruct scenes. We change, we move, we eliminate objects to create an effective painting or picture. Uh, it's a very, very different process than a documentary photographer who walks into a scene and there it is. You have to rapidly analyze what you see. You only have a moment or two to decide where you want to photograph it from. And you have to be thinking about all those things that the paint artist, for instance, can take months to figure. You have to do it in seconds. So it's a very, very different art than uh, most of what we see generally in museums. Now to the project at hand. Uh, long before the Great Depression, there's no question about it that uh, rural America, particularly the South, was a rough place to live. If you were a tenant farmer or a sharecropper, you literally lived season to season. Uh, one of the things that was really rough about it was that you could never make enough to break out of the cycle. You were caught forever. The page that you see uh, as you look at your screen on the right is from a newspaper format uh, of uh, that was prepared by the Farm uh, Security Administration to just to show people throughout the rest of the country what the state was. It included the South, but it also included the Northeast, the Midwest, the Far West, the Dust Bowl, all of those things. Now, this is a local presentation in that if you take a look at the stars on the map, you will see that most of the pictures that I've chosen, and I went through probably about 3,000 pictures to get down to the ones that, the 60 or so that you'll see, uh, are documented in the places that have the black stars on the map. As the depression deepened, uh, things got really bad for an awful lot of the sharecroppers and the tenant farmers. In fact, many of them became, in addition to what they were before, migrants. Why did that happen? Because the government paid farmers not to produce because the prices were too low on the goods. Large landowners evicted thousands of sharecroppers from unplanted land because why do you don't need them there if they can't produce any crop. All you're doing at that point is feeding them, which is not economically viable. And finally, uh, farming mechanized. One cotton picking machine could do the work of 75 men. So obviously there was less of a need for all these rural people and what happened to them? Well, obviously in many cases, particularly as World War II came about, they went north. And an awful lot of the uh, urban populations of cities today are folks who fled from the South because frankly, there was nothing to eat. Farm Security Administration was created by the Roosevelt administration to help sharecroppers, tenant farmers and migrant workers. They resettled people on productive land, promote, promoted soil conservation, emergency relief, and they loaned money to farmers to buy and improve farms. Uh, they did all sorts of things. But one of the main things that we have today because of this is a tremendous documentation of life in the mid 30s through the mid 40s in America, not just rural America, but urban America also. But of course, our emphasis here is on rural America because our region is substantially at that time was rural. Uh, they hired the photographers based on their abilities. And uh, here's what one of them said. I was out in the field most of the time. Sometimes I'd be gone for seven or eight weeks at a time. And I had no idea of knowing what the reaction was. I think the pictures were all honest. There was a great deal of honesty in these pictures. Roy Stryker, that was the program administrator, was a great believer in the integrity of a photograph. He would never countenance any kind of fakery in a photograph. And it's a picture of uh, Rothstein with Roy Stryker and two others. Two thirds of all sharecroppers were white. One third were black. They were both at the bottom of the social ladder and that caused them to organize in 1934 the Southern Tenant Farmers Union which uh, upset things an enormous amount. And again, uh, 
The Great Depression, modernization, and World War II probably led sharecropping to fade away in the 40s. Now, I want you to look at this picture. The way this picture is set out in terms of art is real interesting. We have a thing generally when we do art called the rule of the odds, odds, O-D-D-S, one, three, five, those numbers work. Twos, fours, for some reason, don't. Here you have a beautiful composition because what you've got in essence is a nice V. And here I'll, I'll show you with my cursor, a nice V here set against uh, slightly higher than one third of the way up landscape. And what that tends to do is it creates, in fact, it could also be viewed as circular for what it's worth, but it, it creates a situation where the figures look like they're overwhelmed by both the ground and the sky. And you wonder as you look at this picture, will they ever get done with their hose? Because there's so much to be done. So I think it's a great picture. And uh, uh, Lang, uh, as usual, was to, took a terrific picture there. Uh, now, the sharecroppers declared war. And so what happened was the plantation owners fought back. And there were floggings, kidnappings, lynchings. And they, they were economic based for the most part, but the union did grow. Now, one of the interesting th things about the union was that it started basically under socialist leadership, but like any other uh, institution that succeeds, they adopted our evangelical and populist traditions here from the South so that uh, they were able to uh, grow and influence things in a manner that uh, would not have been possible if they just you know, had a bunch of folks from the Northeast who were socialists come down and attempt to change it. Didn't happen that way. A uh, nice picture of the family uh, singing family hymns. I thought it played nicely against the uh, union. This is probably one of the sadder pictures, believe it or not. This gentleman received $5 a month furnish from a landowner. Now in today's dollars, that's about $1,200 a year which would be a little tough to live on. The union at the same time was asking for about $9,000 a year. Now, if you take a look at things, and this is the telling figure to me, the average earnings in agriculture in the United States in 1937 was $7,100. If, but if you went north or went to a large area like Birmingham or Atlanta, you could earn $2,700 in manufacturing. What did that uh, cause? Obviously it helped cause the depopulation of the rural South. A lot of folks became homeless, as, as we mentioned before. This is a picture of a uh, young uh, boy uh, from a migrant family. They were obviously sharecroppers or farm workers who got moved off and uh, instead they lived in a tent and followed the crops. Uh, in this day and age, we tend to think of people who are migrants as being uh, non-U.S. persons. But in fact, uh, back then, they were all, uh, well, to a degree, some of them were us, so to speak. Sharecroppers. Uh, the region's large Native American population uh, carried most of the burden. In 1930, 80% of the American Blacks lived in the South. And of course, they lived through Jim Crow and the photographers again documented what they saw. Here you have another situation where you've got a couple figures and they're shown against a huge field with a big sky. And again, the implication is they just keep working but never finish. First photographer we're going to look at is Dorothea Lang. Uh, this is her iconic picture. It's hanging at the museum right now. Uh, it is probably in the 20th century, the most famous photograph taken by anyone. Uh, there's a certain Madonna thing to it. Now I'll read you a little bit about it. In early March, 1936, Dorothea Lang drove past a sign reading Pea Pickers Camp in Nipomo, California. 20 miles down the road, she reconsidered, turned back to the camp where she encountered a mother and her children. Here's the quote from her. I saw and approached the hungry and desperate mother as if drawn by a magnet. 
She said that they'd been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding field and birds that the children killed. She took seven exposures of the woman that Lang did and uh, various combinations with her seven children. One of the exposures was this one. Uh, and it's termed, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York calls it a Madonna-like figure. It became a great, an icon of the Great Depression and one of the most famous photographs in history. It was first uh, exhibited at uh, MoMA in 1940 under the title Pea Picker Family, California. But by 1966, the name had evolved to Migrant Mother, Napomo, California. So at any rate, let's take a look and see what uh, Ms. Lang's got to say. How do you tell others about what you think is worth telling? No one was ever given exact directions. You were turned no. loose in the region. And the assignment was see what is really there. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What actually is the human condition? It's uh, hard to get by. Between Buck Creek and Whitewater Creek, nobody can make a living. I remember when the Yankees came through. Yeah, a whole pastel of them hollered and told the Negroes, you free. I don't know whether that drought was the devil's work or the Lord's work. In three days, everything wilted. This country is a hard country. They won't help bury you here. If you die, you're dead. That's all. This life is simplicity boiled down. Yes, sir, we've star stalled and stranded. Living a bum's life shouldn't make a bum out I was out born of. and raised. So like I couldn't do nothing if I went back. A human being has a right to stand like a tree. They don't has stop right to shut the door, they just walk out. The human face is the universal language. The same expressions are readable, understandable all over the world. It's explosions of emotion and passion, all concentrated on just this part of the human anatomy. One day I was working here, and it came to me. The deprived and the dislocated. And then the word came to me, rootless, the walking wounded. There was another phrase that was in my mind. The last ditch. The last ditch. There we go. Okay. Uh... So let's start with the pictures that she took. First one is uh, Welcome to Georgia. Uh, it's attention vagrants, conviction means hard labor gang. So that, that's a lovely one. Uh, the next one we have basically shows the relationships between people. Uh, very interesting that the, obviously the overseers in the front, the folks are behind him. Uh, what I wanna really convey by this picture is the doodle. Uh, the Doodlem book uh, had interest that these people paid to the farm store for, on the plantation and they charged them too much for the stuff and then charged them 10 to 25 cents on the dollar interest. So you could work the whole season, they'd bring the harvest in, you'd pay it off and you'd have nothing. Georgia tenant farmer. Now this man's face, particularly the one on the right, I don't know, what, what, is there any hope left? This crop is nigh to nothing, as I ever said. It means he's got nothing for all the work that he's put in. What, is he gonna feed his family the rest of the year? Peach picker. They uh, actually did better 
doing what she was doing than a lot of the folks who were saddled to the land, but still wasn't a whole lot. What's she thinking? Boy, oh boy, I don't know. Interesting picture. Desperation. These guys are heading off to Lord knows what. Uh, but the three figures sitting there with no movement, it, it, just, it just causes you to just wonder, are they heading towards something better or worse? I have no idea. This picture is a great one. It's another, it's another one that shows what happens when you take a silhouette for the most part against a lighter background, progressively out, lighter even to the sky. And what it does is it places that silhouette in a position where you wonder how he's ever gonna get all that work done. Uh, it shows the, the sheer you know, enormity of what he's trying to do, this one person pitted against. Another way of doing it would have been to have a picture with a very small figure in a horse, with a, you know, the rest of the picture remaining about the same. But this works every bit as well, and you can actually see them. Sometimes when things get really bad, people manage to retain their dignity, their pride. And you can see that in this gentleman. He is a farmer who's just been moved, uh, just moved rather into uh, an impoverished county in northern Georgia from the Georgia Hills. And yet you can see that he still has personal dignity which is important, I think. Uh, the two insets to the side show uh, a little bit about cropping. Generally, when we look at a picture, whether it's uh, you know, something that someone paints with watercolor or a photograph, uh, you tend to think of placing a tic-tac-toe board over the top. And generally where the lines cross is where you want the object of your picture to be. And as you can see, before uh, the red uh, tic-tac-toe board kind of places him in the wrong place. Uh, it takes away from the picture. But the, the green one, on the other hand, does place his face pretty much where you want to have it. And that's the reason that these crop lines appear. I don't know who put these crop lines on Lang's picture, whether it was Lang or whether it was someone from the uh, Farm Security Administration, because they did edit a lot of these pictures. So just a nice thing to know. Now, which of these two pictures is more interesting? Uh, I would maintain, as I look at them, and, and this, was, you know, this was actually taken pretty, pretty locally, uh, just north of Jacksonville. The one on the right, you're looking at them, it's interesting, you see everything, but unfortunately the background does tend to get in the way. And the composition of it, I mean, it's all right, but it's nothing to write home about. The one on top, there's a little bit of mystery there. Uh, the pictures really stand out against the sky, the sky obviously being a better thing to photograph them against. One of the things the Impressionists learned uh, back in the 19th century was that uh, odd angles make interesting pictures. So a lot of Impressionist stuff would be from on high or down low rather than straight across. And again, that's another thing you see is the difference between these two pictures. The one on the right is straight at them. The other one is looking up at them. Also. In terms of the feel of the picture, the one on the top has a bit of an inspirational bit to it because you are looking up at them. And I think maybe instinctually that's because we tend to do that with God, so to speak. Whereas the one looking straight at him, I don't know what it says, but not a lot to me. So as I say, the one on the left is a much better picture, in my opinion. This is one of the stranger pictures that Lang took. And it's a terrific picture because nothing's quite where it belongs. First of all, you're going light, dark, light, dark, uh, which is all right. Uh, you've got the way the wood goes, the grains of the wood coming toward you and then going away from you. But what makes this picture work is not the subject of the picture. It's the little girl in the background. And I've blown her up so you can see her better. I'm not sure exactly what her emotion is, but I can tell you it's nothing real positive. And so you've got this woman sitting there, and this is the woman who had the crops go in three days. She's sitting there just kind of looking, you know, like you look when you're just sitting staring out at something. The little girl, on the other hand, is looking at this whole process and going, I don't buy it. 
So I think it's, I think it's the most interesting picture. Uh, one of the most interesting ones that, that, that I'll show you. This is one of the saddest ones. Uh, this guy uh, apparently uh, went to Georgia with his family so he could go into a sewing machine or lawnmower repair business. However, he's leaving because he couldn't afford the $25 for the license. So they're going back to Alabama. And there they sit on the side of the road waiting for whatever. These pictures I, I stuck in largely because uh, they're in Valdosta. And uh, it's always interesting to see what's, what's interesting. I've got one from Tifton and this is from Valdosta. Uh, it, it, they're local pictures. And it just shows a little bit of what was going on. Apparently turpentine was big business in that part of the world at that time. This is a much more interesting picture. This is the wife of one of the turpentine workers. And there's a certain dignity that she shows that I, that I, that I find very pleasing. Uh, and it's an interesting picture too, because of the way the window uh, is opened, it comes out at us and it, it just draws you into it. Nice picture. This is the saddest picture of the whole bunch. It's a 13 year old sharecropper. Uh, if you take a look, I think he's not got shoes on. He's hooked to the plow, literally tied to it. And you look at his face and you wonder, is there any future? It's, it's, it's that a 13 year old would be out having to do something like that is a little bit frightening to me. Cotton sharecropper family and uh, the daughter just gives you a feel. This is the, this is the family of the gentleman who was making the uh, five dollars a month. Just so you can see what they look like. This is the couple that you saw in the short film that, uh, uh, saw the Union Army come through and I placed them in front of some plantations that are abandoned. And I, I think one of the things that, that it's, it's very evident is the fact that it wasn't just the, the, the poorest people who went out, uh, an awful lot of the plantations went under too. This guy's kind of an interesting character study. Uh, he's busy fixing a tire and uh, they traveled all over the place, they have one possession of note, and that is that old Ford. And they use that to uh, migrate all the way from Florida up to Tennessee. Another picture of him is kind of interesting. This is one of the stranger pictures. Uh, this is a gentleman uh, and a pig. And I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is. It looks like the pig's back leg is you know, hooked to a line and he's holding the other end of the line. And I don't know where this leads, but I do know the tree is kind of strange and so is the picture. In fact, it's one of the odder pictures I've ever seen. Again, I included it because it was Tifton. And uh, you know, who knows, maybe it's, uh, it's under the interstate now where this was, I have no idea. And th this would be a picture of uh, one of the plantation owners or whatever, they just show the difference. Now, the next pictures are going to be uh, Walker Evans, and we'll go through these reasonably quick. Let's take a look at his. Between 1935 and 1938, during the height of the Depression, Walker Evans worked for the Resettlement Administration, a government agency that provided assistance to the rural poor and migrant agricultural workers. The agency hired photographers to document living and working conditions in America. Evans's assignment was to create photographs that illustrated the problems and progress of the administration. In one way, the Depression was good for artists uh, because uh, those who didn't want to get sucked into full-time commercial work were unable to anyway. There wasn't any commercial work to do. I uh, was very innocent about government, about Washington. But I found that I could get a job there. I did it so carelessly. I just photographed everything that attracted me at the time. And um, rather unconsciously was recording that period. I didn't think of it as such. Uh, the work piled up 
And uh, the sum of it is looked at uh, now as a record that I wasn't even thinking of making. In the summer of 1936, Walker Evans took time off from his work with the Resettlement Administration to collaborate with the writer James Agee. Agee was writing an article for Fortune magazine about white southern sharecroppers who were hard hit by the Depression. The two men traveled to Alabama and Mississippi to work on the assignment. Evans recalls their experience working in the Deep South. There was a lot of talk around town about us, about what we were doing. Uh, the landowners and the police were watching us all the time and uh, were rather uh, anxious to get us out of there. I think they suspected that we were labor organizers. The work produced in the Depression looks like social protest. It wasn't intended to be. It wasn't intended to be used as propaganda for any cause. I suppose I was interested in calling attention to something and even shocking people. But I don't think I had the purpose of improving the world. I like saying what's what. <laughs> Though the magazine decided not to print the article, in 1941, Evans and A.G. published their work as a book titled, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. The book failed to appeal to wartime readers, but after the war ended, it became a critical success, praised by readers and critics alike for its unstaged and dignified portrayal of farm life in the rural South. For almost 50 years, Walker Evans made pictures that aimed to capture the essence of American life. People and their way of life were what fascinated him, whether in the metropolis or on Main Street. He recorded the interiors and exteriors of their homes, the clothes they wore. He documented store signs, shop windows, city streets. Evans describes the challenges and rewards of making photographs. I do regard photography as an extremely difficult act. I believe the achievement of a work that is evocative and mysterious and at the same time realistic is a great one and a rare one and perhaps sometimes almost an accident. It's akin to hunting, photography is. Uh, in the same way that uh, you're using a machine and you're actually uh, shooting something and you're shooting to kill. You get the picture you want, that's a kill. That's a bullseye. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Now we'll take a look at some of the contrast the Walker Evans uh, photograph because I think they're really interesting. Uh, this is a gravestone in Louisiana. It's a gentleman, his hunting dog, his hound. And this is a child's grave. Kind of frightening, huh? Abandoned plantation house, uh, resettlement homestead. Again, showing the difference. Coal miner's home. Notice uh, that we keep the cold out with all sorts of posters from stores for products, including Santa Claus. And we come across the sign for the J.W. McDonald Furniture Company that is a really interesting piece of folk art. <laughs> but it does show what the aspiration was versus the way they actually lived, the way they lived and the aspiration of the way they lived, want to live. And then, of course, you've got the uh, two adjacent barber shops. One, obviously, is the black shop. The other one's the white one. Family, uh, showing abject poverty of these folks in Hale County, Alabama. I mean, you don't get much poor in this. And who's doing the observing? Here, you've probably got a police officer, I would imagine, in the vehicle. Uh, and he's watching the photographer, which is exactly what Evans noted occurred. 
And uh, we all remember these kinds of stands. Some of them are still around. Movie posters. Now, uh, Arthur Rothstein uh, was a very interesting photographer. And I think that uh, what I like most about his work was what he did with children and uh, for the uh, administration. Professional photographers, photojournalists in particular, see the world in a different way. They don't see it the way ordinary people do. They're very conscious of what's happening in the foreground, what's happening in the background. They look at things in depth, and their eyes have become sensitized to events so that they look at things which, with much more perception, with greater clarity. And that's just part of the expertise, part of the development and training of a good photographer. I've photographed a great many people, famous people. Uh, Durante was a great entertainer, as you know, and uh, his, his uh, uh, big feature, you might say, was his nose. And so I exaggerated the size of his nose by using a wide-angle lens. Uh, when people say to me, uh, what is your specialty? I always say, my specialty is versatility. I, uh, I enjoy the challenge, whatever it is. If it's a food photograph, it requires a different kind of attention than a fashion photograph, let's mm -hmm. say, or a news photograph. But in each case, I try to find out what those qualities are and do them to the best of my ability. Now, it turns out that I'm pretty good at food photographs. I've won a great many awards. But I'm not so hot at fashion photog photography. <laughs> that it, it doesn't mean that I can't do it. Right. But I've never won awards for my fashion photographs. On the other hand, I'm terrific with portraits. So there are lots of different things that you do better than others because you have the ability, and maybe a little bit is the inclination, to, to approach things in a certain way. I believe that a documentary photographer is one who produces photographs that are honest, straightforward, and objective with the purpose of educating, informing, and perhaps persuading the viewer of those photographs. Okay, we'll go to our last set of phot photographs and we'll be finished. Uh, this is the son of a rehabilitation client. Now there's two pictures here. One's got a hole punched in it. That's because someone decided that one was not to be used. Now, when I look at those, I, I say to myself, what a shame, because the photograph on the left actually shows the kids sharpening an ax. The one on the right essentially is posed. It's not nearly as interesting to me. Here, uh, you've got a mother, and I can remember my mother kind of putting her arm up to her forehead like that. Something's going on. We don't know precisely what it is, but we know something's going on. This is kind of a sad one, a child of, uh, of a cotton sharecropper in Mississippi. And I just think the way he stares up. Thing of this picture that's most interesting is the mother in the background. She's still got her dignity. You can see it in her face. She's proud of her children. I love it. Where do you play if you're the son of a sharecropper in cotton land? On the cotton. Another young fellow sitting there. Now, here's where we begin to see a little bit of the propaganda aspect of it. This is the happy kids now of the family that's been resettled. These are some folks who are going to be resettled. This is the boy who's been resettled. He's in 4-H club and he really looks pretty good. Uh, just an interesting photograph of a nice little child in uh, Louisiana. Another resettled one. See how nicely dressed he is, scrubbed t t t every bit. And then just three or four pictures here, and we'll be done of migrants. Uh, just a little show of the tension. Look at the tension on the left side between that young lady and her brother. It's palpable. It's an interesting picture. These kids, they live in this 
place while their folks are migrating to Florida. The only water in the place is up at the top of the stairs, the sink. And that's for the whole building. Kind of frightening, but they do have a dog, which is nice. A couple of children of migrants living in a tent. Again, another picture with a bit of dignity, young girl looking, I guess, uh, out the window. We're looking at Betty Davis, just opposite her there in the picture. Uh, something documenting selling a quilt, again, using the newspaper and everything else to keep the cold out. A white rural school, a black rural school, black school obviously being attached to the church because they're not allowed to go to the white school at that time. And that is it, uh, other than the last picture, a farm boy with bull weevils in a bag. And with that, uh, I will toss that back to, uh, to Grace and uh, Angie. So Tom, would you like to stop your screen share and we will see if um, anyone has any questions for you. I don't see any questions in the chat. Well, Angie, did you have any questions for Tom? No, I mean, I just, I found it really interesting how, you know, I think you had mentioned that this was the largest document, like a largest photography documentation of America. Um, and is that since as well? Or yeah, is that- I, I'm not aware of any project that even approaches that size. Yeah. Uh, mainly because I don't know that the government's been in the photography business really much since uh, the Depression. I mean, these Roosevelt programs, uh, in a lot of cases, I mean, the same thing with the rural electrification, TVA and all of that. I mean, they built more dams than, any, than anybody's built since in more hydroelectric plants. So, yeah, I think that <coughs> America was changed by much of this. And uh, you couple all the things that the Roosevelt administration did with the Second World War, which which some credit as, as having brought us out of the Depression, really. Uh, America in 1950 had no resemblance to America in 1930. None whatsoever mm -hmm. that I can see. Is, is there a place where these images are all archived together or are they in different collections now from well, the FSA? I, I, the, the, the majority of them or in the Library of Congress, uh, the photographic collection there. But I also always tend to go to MoMA, to uh, Art Institute of Chicago, and some of those other larger museums, because a lot of times they'll have a better copy of something that's already at Library of Congress. I mean, they, they've spent more time preserving them and making sure they look good and they're in good shape. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and some of the photographers, like uh, Rothstein's daughter, uh, that site, that last video that we did, uh, the family is pushing, you know, obviously, his art, Rothstein's art. Uh, I don't know that Lang has anyone to do that, but uh, Roth does, Rothstein does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm just going to um, share a couple more things. Um, you know, this exhibition that we had, uh, that a big portion of the, the pieces that um, are in this and uh, masters of American photography are from this kind of era, the farm security is administration. And so it's really great to get a better and in depth feeling for what that program was and what they'd captured. So um, it's also, all you heard. I'm sorry, it's an interesting reminder of um, our quality of life as Americans right now and how high our expectations are <laughs> versus how people were living not too long ago um you know 90 years ago and 80 years ago and it, you know into the world wars it um it's amazing how we get so fixated on the present we lose our perspective from history yeah grace i'd like to say one other thing for what it's worth um you know this concentrated on our local area but uh my father related to me when he was a young man he went to work in the depression he was born in 1918, so he, it, was, it was late teens, early 20s. Went to work at a furniture factory up in New Jersey. And uh, the, between the sawdust in the air and the noxious chemicals that they used, he told me he lasted three days. And then, you know, quit because he just physically couldn't take it anymore. 
So what we're seeing here that, that I've localized to the South occurred in other ways in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And I think that the sum total of it was that uh, sociologically, when you look at it, the middle class that we know of today was created by the Second World War and the subsequent uh, economic stuff that occurred in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't exist back in 1930, not in the same way. You'd have maybe your attorneys, lawyers, and a few other folks who ran factories or had farms who had all the money in 1930. By the time you get to 1950, you've got a burgeoning middle class, which has changed, obviously, everything about the way we act in America. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Angie. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was just going to interrupt you and, and say, um, Betty, I see your hand is raised. Did you have a question? Actually, it was more of a comment. Um, when we were looking at this exhibit yesterday, it, I mean, as I think, uh, as you mentioned, it's, you know, you, you have to be there at the right time and you have to grab it and you can't edit it later. And how different that is from the way we view photography now. I mean, we were looking at these pictures and say, well, how can you have fake news with something like this to document? And yet now with our editing capacities, we produce fake news all the time. And it's, 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 it's photography is propaganda, but it's not the photography. It's the editing and the transposing and the cutting and pasting and things like that that would make fake news all the more possible to produce. Betty, I'll, I'll read you something I didn't use because it wasn't quite relevant to you brought it, you know, you made your remark. In an essay in 1952, Lang criticized uh, contemporary photography as being a, in a state of flight, seduced by the spectacular, frenzied, and unique at the expense of the familiar and intimate. She talked uh, about going against trend and not being more concerned with illusion than reality. In other words, doctored photographs. Wow. And, and today, that's even more the case because we've got the, you know, the photographic editing stuff where you can do anything to any picture. Mm -hmm. uh, you can put a head of someone on the body of someone else mm -hmm. and, and such. So yes, I, I think that's a very valid point. Anyone else? Well, I'm gonna just share a little bit. You know, we've got um, Masters of American Photography on display through the end of June. I hope you will be able to come and see it in person. And um, Art and Gadsden, our 34th Art and Gadsden is gonna be opening in July. And if you're an artist and you plan on submitting, the deadline for that is May 13th. So it's coming up soon. <laughs> so also we are going to send out a survey link today. If you would give us some feedback on our Art Talks Live programs, this and any others, and also any requests you have for programming. We do plan to continue our live online programming. We also love to be able to record these and post these later so we can tell our visitors to this show that we have this resource available online. So um, please take a moment to take the survey. I'll email it out right after we hop off this Zoom. We uh, appreciate your feedback. And whenever you have any comments or suggestions or questions, don't hesitate to email or call me or reach out to Angie. Um, we're always happy to talk to you. Um, last but not least, we also, as we mentioned earlier, have guided group visits for adults and we have field trips for children. We love having groups in. There is no charge um, for these programs other than non-member adult admission. And so if you'd like to schedule a guided group visit for any group of four or more or a field trip, just give me a call and we'd love to have, you, have your group in. And with that, thank you again, Tom, for a wonderful presentation. I sure appreciate it. It, it was wonderful. Um, just there's so much to learn from this exhibition, so much to think about. So appreciate you taking your time to do this for us. And thank you all for signing on today. I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank Marvelous. You.